Okay, so what does the Bible say about money? Money? Well, I wish I had some. <laughs> is that what the Bible says? No. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a good topic to talk about. It's uh, Money is something that we're uh, all familiar with, and um, we um be good to hear what uh, scriptures have to say about it. There's a lot of, I think, a lot of wrong interpretations about what the Bible says about money and wealth. Uh, you know, money is the root of all evil, right? Isn't that what the Bible says? Actually, it's the love of money. It's the root of all evil. Yeah. Uh, good. That was a gotcha question. Yeah, no, and that came up in Bible study yesterday, so that was at the front of my mind, and uh, um, yeah, a lot of times we take verses out of context, or we take words out of verses, and that's that's one that's, uh, when it comes to money, that's uh, often thrown about, you know, money is the root of all evil. No, it's the love of money, and so we've uh, got some good things to discuss today about uh, what the scriptures have to say about money, so um, where do you want to start with this? <laughs> um, I would say, you know, let's start with it as a first article gift. What does that mean? Uh, the first article, article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And, and how Luther, Luther explains that we believe that God has created us in all things. And all these things that we have, marriage, uh, the ability to make money, to grow food, uh, procreate, children, wife, husband, you know, the whole family, the whole nine yards. These are all gifts of God. Food, wine, uh, all the great things. Yeah. What's that? nature yeah yeah exactly yeah everything that we have is a gift from god for us to enjoy which includes wealth money the ability to purchase things or to earn that money as well and uh they are meant for good yeah yeah i got yeah god gave it to us for a purpose and and i think uh maybe uh another place to start foundationally uh, so so you're saying it's a first article thing. Everything belongs to God. Um, it's kind of the thing there. So so money would be part of that. But but really that the concept money as a conceptual thing, money is is a human creation. Not that God wasn't involved in it. But what money does is it's is literally just storing up work so that you can transfer it for some other good or service. Um, so it's it's really just a tool and. And um, as with any tool, that it can be used well or it can be abused. And so um, having that understanding of, you know, it's, it's just a way of transferring um, energy, transferring work, transferring effort, transferring services or, or, or products to something else, it, it kind of puts it into perspective that, that it, it by itself cannot be evil, um, but, but the way it's used can have evil um, ends, evil intentions, evil um, all around it. Yeah, and you can also, I, I looked at, the, it, you know, I like the idea how you called it a tool, uh, because it is a tool in the sense of man now has to, mankind has to uh, get their bread by the sweat of their brow. And it's part of that process of, as you said, accumulating that work to yourself and then transferring it. And it's been that way since the fall. You know, of purchasing and buying and selling and, and man you know from that work from that sweat of his brow and working for his bread yeah it's it's part of society as society has grown it just kind of naturally came up with the growth of society and right. civilization yeah. yeah yeah so yeah money money is uh certainly something we 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 can't um not participate in money and i don't think we as christians would not want to would would want to avoid it because it like we're saying it's not by itself an evil thing um but so i that there is mind do you think there would have been a currency if there was no fall into sin (laughs) that's a good question it's a what if i mean we don't see that everything was provided by god and uh before the fall i mean there was no jealousy or hoarding or in a sense this is mine yeah you know um before the fall so probably not but at the same time you do see you know in revelation you know because money our monetary system is for the most part based off precious metals gold silver right tangible property uh these these are things that are all listed in the new heaven and new earth the new jerusalem yeah just you know i i heard this reminds me of a joke i heard and i'll probably uh not do it justice but you know (laughs) you, you you know the 
the, the statement, you can't take it with you to heaven. So the, uh, the guy comes up to the pearly gates and talks to St. Peter and he's got this wheelbarrow full of gold coins and, and St. Peter starts laughing at him. He looks at him. He's like, why are you laughing? He's like, I've accumulated all this. Look out. And St. Peter's like, why are you bringing the pavement to here? <laughs> you know, we got plenty of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But, so it, I think it goes back to like in the love of money and then the use and how you use money as well for good or for evil. Right. Uh, Timothy talks about that and, and Proverbs as well. will speak on that, how you use money. Yeah, so what, what should money be used for then? Well, it should be good uh, for, well, I, obviously for things taking care of your family, mm -hmm. first and foremost. Uh, also a portion that should always go to God for he's the one who gives you the ability to make that money. Right. As well. Uh, the Bible talks about that in Proverbs that he gives or it's Proverbs or Psalms, I can't remember off the top of my head, where he gives you the ability to make your money, yeah, uh, the power to do so, um, and also for the good of others as well. But I think it should be always done voluntarily and moved as for us Christians, just speaking as us Christians. I can't speak for the outside world. Um, being motivated by the word and will of God, the Holy Spirit working through that, uh, to pushing ways to use your money that in godly ways. Right. For, for the benefit for the of others. Of evil. Yeah, for the good of others. And, and now the inverse of that would be not for the causes of evil. Right. Yeah. So, so you brought up given to, uh, given to the church. What is, what do you think, what does the Bible say about supporting the church? I, I always like to, from time to time, I like to say during church, you know, back when we gathered offerings here at Trinity, we don't pass the plate anymore. I don't know if we ever will actually, but um, I know Concordia reintroduced the passing of the plate in these post-COVID days, and and that's fine. It's it's one of those things that's neither commanded nor forbidden in Scripture. Right. So we um, collect it at the doors here at Trinity, but but during that time of offering, I would often say, um, you know, God doesn't need your money, um, but you know, this is a, a response of an acknowledgement of His His giving to you. But it's also, I mean, real practically, by giving to the church, you're allowing the work of the church to continue. Um, does, it, does the Bible say more about that? Does it give us, you know, is it, are we supposed to give 10%? Is it? Um... You know, that, that's a, that's a good question. And I, I can only speak from Lutheran circles. There's, there's good Lutherans on both sides of this debate. Um, I'm of the one, yes, the Old Testament talks about 10%. Um, that's an Old Testament, but that's part of the, the what was the, uh, the ceremonial law. Right. And, uh, but that was nailed to the cross. If you really want to go by a true standard of giving of what Jesus talked about, which is the law, it's the woman who gave all she had at the temple door. Yeah. And so I've always said it this way. You, you give as the Holy Spirit moves you to give. And but also at the same time, realize you also have to have that money for take care of your family. Right. Uh, and for other important things as well. Because you never want to be just give everything you got to the church and then your family starves. Yeah. Or or vice versa. Or your pastor starves, you save it all for your family. Right. You know, uh, it's always a balance, but it's always based on the individual families and, and, and their decisions and how God is working through them with their giving. I, I don't like to put it into making a law thing. Yeah. Um, and it, it's amazing too, it, just in my years past when I was council president at, uh, at my home congregation, uh, we were part of a balcony project that we did. And we, we borrowed some money to do that and uh, got everything done. Everything was great. And then we were tell we showed the congregation how much we still owed. Mm -hmm. And within three or four months, it was paid off. Yeah. Just, and we didn't ask people really, you know, we provided ways if you like to donate to this. But we didn't give like a certain amount. We didn't uh, come at it from a law perspective. Right. And it was amazing how God's people uh, just stepped forward and it was paid off. Yeah. And so that was always a, a good lesson for me is our giving should be always motivated by the gospel. Right. No, I, I love that way of thinking. And I that, that brings to mind for me something that happens on the regular here, you know, sitting in council meetings and stuff at, at, at church, you know. It seems like, at least in my 10 years of experience here, that we've had um, 
you know, it always seems like towards the end of the year, we always have this gap and it's always a negative gap. It's hardly, I think only once or twice has been a positive gap, but um, there's, and there's a lot of times there's anxiety with it. Are we going to be able to meet the budget? And um, we've, we've leaned heavily and we lean heavily into the Lord providing for the work that he needs to do. And so I, I think one of the, the blessings of not making it a law um, is, is you, you focus on what the money is for, what, what, what the work you're called to do it, how you're able to do it is is the money able to fund it and oh we're having a fire drill here <laughs> so so that um it kind of it's it's a very different perspective and it comes from a trust in the lord and, and i can even uh, go into that but i won't get into it the personal side of things you know as a family looking at our family budget there's been times when katie and i have you know wondered where is it going to come from how are we going to make ends meet and the, the lord always shows up and and I don't, it it's almost sounds like prosperity gospel, but when you're doing what you need to do, you, you can trust that the Lord will provide to make it happen. Right. And yeah, because I think the, the, you make, you bring up a good point, the prosperity gospel stuff. Yeah. That, that's a different, now how it's used in, in our American context, it's been abused in a sense, you know, you, you hand over, hand me a hundred dollars seed money and you're going to receive 10,000 back. Right. You know, I think that's how it's been abused. But which way you describe it, um, we God's people do prosper because he does provide for us and all the things we need. Like in Matthew, the birds of the air don't worry about what they're going to eat. Yeah. You know, they, they are provided. They're, they're prospering because yeah. they're receiving what they need from God. Yep, absolutely. And that's that. Yeah, that just to define it clearly, that prosperity gospel is the idea that if you live according to God's word, you're going to receive abundant blessings. <laughs> the scripture is quite clear on that. Uh, Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. <laughs> he doesn't say, in this world, if you follow my rules, it's going to be easy for you. It's it's quite opposite. What, what God actually tells us is the Christian life. And, and so the prosperity gospel is very popular, in, especially in our American context these days, this idea that um, health and wealth will come your way as long as you do things the right way and that's that's not the way god works well and some of this pro just the how understanding what does it mean to prosper mm -hmm. right in a biblical sense i mean I, i've seen this abuse like in psalm 1 uh verses 2 it says he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its seeds and its leaves does not wither and all that he does he prospers and i've seen this being taken out of context but i think in luther's commentary on psalm 1 he brings a nice uh, point of view of what it means to prosper. Sometimes this prospering is a hidden prospering. Yeah. Sometimes it's hidden under the cross or in your own trials and tribulations. Uh, even though we don't see that the value or our, our potential to prosper under those cir circumstances, but it is, we are prospering in a sense because it's driving us back to the cross, which right. is our ultimate source of what it means to prosper in this right. life. Uh, given the hope of eternal life right yeah what's the verse that says uh trust in the lord and he will give you the desires of your heart um yeah that's another pray that that uh when when in, in the, the the key for under delight yourself in the lord and he will give you the desires of your heart and and that that verse interprets itself when you slow down to listen to it if you're delighting in the lord then the desire of your heart is the lord and all of the gifts he he desires right. you to have so um i think sometimes people will approach that and say well my heart really desires that lamborghini so i'm going to delight in the lord so i can get that desire of my heart and that's not the way it works no and that's one of those things that uh it kind of goes along with the concept of prayer when you're praying for spiritual things that god has promised you're always going to receive those things forgiveness right. of sins but when we're praying or desiring things for temporal things in this life god's going to answer those in accordance to his will right and it, along with wealth and money as well as as uh, as you need in your life yeah and, and sometimes we we say and, and it's true we don't know the the minutia will of god we don't know the day-to-day -day will of god but we do know the grand will of god and that is he desires all people to be saved so you can trust what he's providing for you or what he's walking you through are for the good of of salvation of not just yourself but others around you and we can't always right. see that end but we do know that that's god's greatest desire for humanity right right i, I 
what about uh i know we talk about you know the good gifts of god and as all these things that we enjoy in life are given for us under within his boundaries and framework but you talked earlier about the love of life mm -hmm. is the root of all either what do you think is desire what What's behind that statement, the love of money, that drives men to evil, mankind to evil? Right. Well, I, I, no, great question. It, it, I think the answer, it goes to the first commandment for me, you shall have no other gods. And uh, explanation of that, what does this mean? We should fear love and trust in God above all things. And I think when you're loving money, you're, you're, gonna, um, you're potentially loving it more than you love God. And that that, I think, is the where things go off the rails, where you make money into an idol, you make money into a God, you look to it for all good. And you, um, and, and even if you have it, and it, it can be an idol, but even the lack of it can be an idol, because you start to think that because you don't have money, um, you, you still, you still kneel at the altar of, of accumulation of wealth or of, of even income, just to say, well, I don't have it. So I'm not doing well. And, and that's not how God measures or distributes his goodness to you. You're, you're you're good because of Jesus, and and whether or not you have as much money as you perceive you need or or would want, that that has nothing to do with your ultimate eternal standing, and and that that I think is where it comes in is when when we make money an idol. Yeah, it. Uh, yes, Luther talks about this. I'll bring up in his large catechism on the first commandment. Yeah, it's just got a nice little paragraph here, and, and bear with me on this. But it says this point I must un fold more clearly it may be understood and seen through ordinary counterexamples many a person thinks that he has got or that he has god and everything in abundance when he has money and possessions he trusts in them and boasts about them with such firmness and assurance as to care for no one such a person has a god by the name of mammon yeah mammon that's it mammon right yeah yeah that. But he kind of does the inverse on this too. If you'd read on farther, he would say yep. that someone who's despondent, right. who doesn't have any money, will also go into despair thinking, well, that God does not love me. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's kind of what I was hinting at. Uh, thanks for reminding me that's in the large catechism. But but that I think that's a great way for us to um, to approach not just money, but really anything in this world, whether it's your your health, your physical health, or or whether it's your your reputation, whether it's your um, your family situation, you know, some people uh, uh, take a lot of pride. Uh, you know, I got five kids. I'm God must really love me. Or some people will despair and say God hasn't blessed us with children. And 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 I think children as well as money and any any good gift that God has given us in this world can become an idol, um, which is an incredible. Um, irony to to sit back and realize that god gives us these good things but but it makes sense when you understand our sinful human nature twists a good um and and, and I, so i think it's a great caution to say whether you're rolling in the dough or you're um in the in the poverty line food line what you, you you need to be careful to make sure that your um your your god is god and anything else that gets in his way is just going to lead you astray and that's that's not um that's not where we want to be. It's not where God wants us to be. Now, what about, uh, you know, we mentioned we, we kind of uh, unpacked the love of money and the dangers behind that. But what about Christians who do have lots of money? Mm -hmm. it, you know, that they have been blessed and through their hard work and God has blessed them. And you can say that because God does. He allowed that to happen. Right. Um, so what about Christians who do have a lot of money? Is, is it sinful to have it? to hold on to it yeah i i like the point you made we were uh talking about um before we went on air you, you talked about how um when you have money you're you're easily more easily tempted towards lusts of the flesh whether it's carnal desires sexual desires or or even just um you know wasteful living where you're taking yeah. money and you're not using it for your, the good of yourself or the good of others um, but just kind of flushing it down the toilet in different ways, um, maybe even um, indulging in, in um, substances or um, things that, that just don't contribute to the ultimate good. And, and I think you said that uh, 
having a lot of money, it comes with the power to indulge in these things. And um, the, the quote, of course, with a uh, great power comes great responsibility. Um, that, yeah. that I think, um, that, it, that I think is what, what's at play here for those who, who are blessed with an abundance of wealth, that, that they now have a greater responsibility to curb the desires of the heart that might be contrary to God's law. It might be contrary to a delighting in the Lord. Delighting in the flesh is, is what God would steer us away from and have us repent of and, and turn to the cross where, where the ultimate price has been paid to deliver us from such things. Right. And even you can see in the, in the first century church, uh, we're studying the book of Acts at Concordia mm -hmm. in our Bible study. And uh, a lot of these Christians met in, in, in homes once they were pretty much expelled from the synagogue. They had to meet in the homes of wealthy Christians. And I'm sure these, I mean, they, they had their wealth. They maintained their wealth, one of the things they were doing. Some of them lost it, unfortunately, probably because of their faith. But the ones who did have their the, this monetary means, it was a place that allowed their homes were big enough to allow for Christians to meet. Yeah, you can see an example where God will use the Christians who have been blessed by these means for the betterment of the church and God's people. Right. Yeah, and and I think that's a, a great key. There is is I think there is a a burden of responsibility, um, and it it's easy for us to speak legalistically this way, but I think it's, um, it can also be a response to the gospel, a third use of the law. Um, you know, when, because you are saved by Christ, how now can my life be used for the kingdom? And, and I think a good, a good wealthy Christian will ask that question. And that doesn't mean you're going to give, you know, your entire, uh, retirement saving your everything towards the church and towards mission work and all those things. No, I, th I think there's still a stewardship that can involve you maintaining that for your family and for uh, the next generation or for future needs that you might have, but but also to keep your eyes open to say, what of this can I use to help the church is a great question for, for Christians of means to ask themselves. Yeah, and I think the mis you bring up a good point about uh, having to give everything away. You think mm -hmm. about, I think it's been, that thought's been brought in to a misunderstanding when you read about the when Jesus called the disciples right to himself, they dropped everything. Yeah. But you know, they, they dropped their vocations. You know, did they, did they sure have, did they have money? I'm sure they still had money right from their vocation, but they, they dropped their way of life, their vocations. And they went into Jesus seminary to become future apostles and, 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 and such for the, for the spread of the gospel. So, and you still see that today. I left my vocation in previous life. And it was a good, I was blessed by that vocation. Right. But I walked, I was called into this and I walked away from that. So, I, but I think there's been a misreading with that is, okay, I now I can just give everything away. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that's good to know. And too, I think there's a lot of times where people will take uh, specific callings in scripture and apply them carte blanche across the yeah. launch right. across the, the board. And, and that's not what's that's Jesus didn't stand up in front of the crowds and say, give up everything and follow me. Um, he, he does say, deny yourself and follow me. Um, but that, but that's not the same thing as getting rid of all your possessions because uh, because as you mentioned earlier, you know, we, we do have the responsibility to care for our families. And, and so you can't um, support the work or, or give the give all your stuff away to the church in order um, at the expense of your family's well-being. That that would be abandoning that that first article gift of your family. That's God get that God's given right. that vocational calling you have as father, mother or son or brother or whatever it might be. No, exactly. And because uh, and I've seen this where uh abuse in a sense where they use the 10 percent rule but that only means you're monetary yeah you know and then you also you have to do your time and your talent as well um where i've seen in our circles where 10 percent uh is used in a good way i sense is a total accumulation of your time talent and treasures and, and but i can just see how that i've seen it in the past how that's been such a burden to mm -hmm. some people or even kept people away from church right because i they, i don't have the money to give a tie you know? right that, that's and, that's that's horrible <laughs> right yeah. yeah and i think we uh mentioned in 
one of our previous topics, you know, it seems like the church is always talking about or asking about money. So I guess we're, we're risking that conception here by having this topic to, tonight. But I, I, I do hope people are hearing that, that God provides. For, right. And, and I, I, like I said, I, I always like to say God doesn't need our money. He doesn't need money for the gospel to go forth. But, but it helps when you're able to provide a place where people can gather in a building. It helps when you're able to provide staffing whose job it is to, to see to the spiritual needs of, of the, the people that are uh, part of a congregation. That it, it helps when you have the money to, to be able to have a school that, that does the, uh, the ministry that, that a congregation is called to. But, um, but God doesn't need it to come from you. He, he's going he's gonna to move the hearts that need to be moved and he's going to um, lead it to, to happen because that's, that's you know, it's within his power. I, I love the story. I, I wanted to mention this one. You know, when Jesus is with the disciples and they, they come up to him, they're talking about the tax and, and Jesus says to go cast a rod and, and they reel in a fish and the fish has the temple tax amount in its mouth. I, I mean, if that's not a first article, like you mentioned at the beginning, right. the reality that God is in control of his creation. This is, this is a first article thing. God, God brought, um, money out of the the sea to pay a tax just to to check the box because he he had things to do that are important for ministry and i think god's going to continue to and he has he's he's got us this far he's going to continue to sustain the ministries we have no, no matter where the money comes from and and it's not a a legalistic thing that we need to do it's it's ideally it's a response god loves a cheerful giver and and he doesn't he it's, so in order to be a cheerful giver it's not a a command placed upon you it's just um this is the work god's given us to do how can you contribute to it is it through finances is it through uh the the gifts that god's given you and your abilities to teach or to to organize things uh or is it in your ability to just show up and be present with people you know the time talents treasures like you said those are all ways we can serve the lord and and i think this big um big, big idol of money sometimes gets in the way of people seeing what god is really all about for his people Eloquy said that God doesn't need our money, but our neighbor does. Yeah, right. And even, yeah, you know, and uh, also do as we're studying the book of Acts. One thing that really came out, jumped out at me, and I never really quite noticed it before. But that early first century community really took care of each other, Christian community. Yeah, they, they, they looked out for the poor amongst them, but they really directed a lot of their care and such for each other. You have like when Paul and Barnabas first, right before their first missionary journey, uh, they were in charge of bringing funds to those Christians in Jerusalem because they were, because there was a famine in the land. Right. Uh, they needed some help and relief uh, for various reasons. They needed right. some funds. So you can see them helping each other as well. And I think that's something that we've somewhat lost that a little bit in the last decades, I guess, in in, in in the American church, in uh, in that sense, because I you know when when they talk about they should you know they will see our love you know they know us by our love right well they will know us by our love by caring how we care for each other yeah and and people who are outside of our Christian communities I think was meant by that was they would see how we care for each other and say you know I really like to be a part of that community yeah uh, and, and which is something. Um, which I think we need to really kind of get focused back to again, especially yep. in our times, you know, we, cause now everything about today is about communities. Well, we, what do we have to offer as a Christian's community? Well, we forgiveness of sin, salvation in Christ, but also a community that takes care of each other, looks out yep. for each other. Yep. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a great uh, natural organic evangelism, if you will, where yeah, right. people exactly. just, see, just see there's something different about these people and, why are they different? And hey, guess what? We can tell you who makes us different, and he wants to make you different too. And yeah, yeah. well, there's there's one verse I wanted to mention, and a couple more that will follow it. But um, Jesus said it's easier for a camel um, to uh, it's either easier for a camel to go through an eye of an eel. <laughs> Let me say this correctly: it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven, to enter the kingdom of God. What is that all about? Well, I, it uh, some have said this is the needle gate of a temple thing. I yeah. yeah, I think I think Jesus says real needle. 
and try to bring the point that it's uh well not only do you have the impossibility of a camel going through an actual eye hole of a needle it's really in that sense of a rich man i think what's going back to what we talked about earlier with the first commandment uh for a rich man who puts their trust in their wealth and riches yeah you know when jesus says in matthew seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all things will be added to you right uh it kind of goes along with Proverbs 11. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. They really, what Jesus said there in the Sermon on the Mount in Proverbs 11 is true riches is Christ's righteousness. Right. Because these earthly things will not have anything of value on the day of judgment. Yeah. It's not going to deliver you from that, including a rich man who puts his is uh, trust in those riches or makes those riches as God. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's, it's one of those, I, for me, I, I love to go to the cross in this, that, yeah, in, in, in the context that Jesus was speaking, I think a lot of times wealth was uh, associated with righteousness. And, and I think our prosperity gospel that we've already mentioned lends people to believe this. Oh, that person has all those things because he's pleased God and God's smiling upon him. And so that's why he's able to have a home in every time zone or whatever it might be. These, these things become indicators of what we perceive to be righteousness or that person's doing things right. Um, and so I think Jesus points out an impossible scenario to say that, no, a, a rich person is not able to earn their way into heaven. They've, they've not blessed, been blessed into heaven by their, um, these, these external trappings that you think might indicate they're good. He, he says it's, it's straight impossible. The only way we can enter heaven is through the one who humbled himself, never even had a place to lay his head. He, he went to the cross and took all of the wrongs so that we can have that righteousness that he wants to give us. And, and that's that I think is it, it calls people away from that idea that uh, wealth is an indication of your status with God, your approval um, from God and, and points us to the place where where he does everything for us. Well, just the uh, the opposite of that is is the idea of self imposed poverty. Yeah, right. We see that throughout just church history too with uh, monasticism. Yep. You know, somehow that now I'm just going to leave everything in the world, and somehow now I can be righteous or in a sense, or we really receive God's blessings by, and we see how that worked with Luther. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And yeah, that's a, that's a great one. There's a there's a new. Uh, new monasticism i think that's arisen in our our present day where people do do seek this out and it, it really not to say it's not wrong to you know become a minimalist or to, right, to right. deny yourself some of the pleasures for the sake of the gospel but i i do think it's on par with the difficulty of walking the wealth line i think it's very difficult to walk that self-imposed poverty line and not make it into a work where you're you're doing these things in order to receive something that is freely given it's it's not something that god is standing there looking at it's like oh that person's really denying their earthly um accumulations and so i'm going to give them heavenly accumulations that's that's not the way god works and and i think there's a lot of um a lot of uh potential disaster in following those paths I'm with you. I'm kinda, I kind of like the idea of being a minimalist to a, to a point. Uh, you know, even every once in a while, you know, go down to Amish country, you know, Holmes County, Ohio or something. And I, and I look at the Amish and how they live. But there is an appeal to that sometimes. My wife would totally disagree with me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but there is an appeal. A simplicity yeah. of, of, of life is appealing. It is. Right. But at the same time, I think it's just, it comes down to, in our context, just being good stewards. Yeah. You know, a, uh, a borrower is a, is a slave to the lender. Yeah. And, you know, and, and the more you get yourself in those situations, uh, wealth and money can become a burden that way. Even though you might not have a whole lot of it, you might owe a lot of it in many different forms. Right. And that's also a way of, it could be just a distraction or a pulling away from the things you should be doing yep yeah yeah there's a a parable uh it's actually 2300 verse over 2300 verses in the bible talk about money 
So I mean, and when people complain about the uh, the church talking about money too much, it's it's one of those things where we're, well, God talks about money, so it's good for us to do that. But uh, Luke chapter twelve um, has this parable. Um, there's someone someone in the crowd came up to him and said, "Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me." But Jesus said to him, "Who made me a judge or arbitrator over you?" Which is an ironic statement because he is the ultimate judge. But uh, the guy said to him. Uh, and then Jesus said to them, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And that's a great statement there. Your life uh, does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And then he told them this parable, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So this is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And I, I mean, Jesus just, he cuts to the heart of it and says, you know, th that that's a great example. This parable is a great example. It, I, it's one of those parables that that doesn't really seem too uh, obscure. A lot of times we hear a parable and there's something bizarre about the parable, you know, whether it's the parable of the sower who's throwing seed on the road like an idiot, or, you know, the parable of the, the prodigal son whose who's prodigal father, you know, gives him his share of the inheritance. Like, why would you do that? Um, but but here, there's really nothing surprising about this because we see this this crazy act of saying look i got it all made i'm just gonna put my feet up and relax but the crazy thing is is that you're putting your faith in these things that can't go with you don't offer you any good beyond the grave and and what what good is it ultimately when when you're putting your ultimate faith or making your ultimate goal to to have the things of this world when god offers us the treasures of eternity you know it uh as you were reading through that parable, even before that, um, when Christ was setting up that parable, um, you know, we talk about, we, we hammered away on, you know, how money can be our God and, and mm -hmm. such. But also, I think there's another side of that, too, is that people will, will put, their, and I, put their identity, place their I identity in their trust of money, in their wealth. Yeah. And I think that drives a lot of, a lot of that, too, in a sense of, Money now becomes a marker of my success in life. Not only to myself, but to everybody around me who, who sees me. So they now see, they identify me. When they see me, my identity is with my success and my riches and my wealth. Right. And we Christians are called to reject that idea. Even, right. even Christians who, who, have, who are wealthy, God's blessings, they are to put their identity in Jesus Christ. Their, the baptismal identity is great language exactly. for, for this. And, and as a, as a Christian steward who has been baptized, you, you're, you're going to use that, that wealth, that the gifts of, of money that God has allowed you to have, you're going to use them for good. It's just the nature of the Holy spirit dwelling within you that, that we get. And um, so that doesn't mean we, we don't get to eat, drink and be merry and enjoy vacations and the like, Perfect. but, but, even a, a good uh, Christian understanding of the purpose of recreation and, and things like that, it's, it's for your good. It's for the good of your neighbor because it allows you to recharge and to refresh and to come back willing and ready to serve um, even better on the other side. And, and I, I feel like that's, that's, I wonder if people wrestle with that or if they just have numbed themselves to the guilt of the, the conscience burdening that, that comes from perhaps overindulgence. And, and I think it would be a healthy thing for people to wrestle with, you know, and, and to come to peace to say that God is allowing me these opportunities. Um, but what can I do from these opportunities that that somebody else might not be able to do? And I, I just feel that there could be a huge shift in, in the uh, the shape of the, the mission of the church if, if people who are able to enjoy um, the things of this world um, on a level that's beyond others that they, they turned, turned around from that time of refreshment and, and poured back into uh, with their souls, uh, their, 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 not their souls, but their, their bodies and minds recharged um, into the, the, the soul health of other people. It's just, I feel like um, that, that would be a really cool thing. I, I would love to see that happen. <laughs> you know, I, I, you really, 
made me think of something. You talk about how Christians who struggle with overindulging and things like that. But, you know, when you have those good things in life, I remind of a, of a pastor friend of yours and mine. He'll post a lot of times on Facebook. He'll have his grill in the back of the yard. You know, he'll be cooking something really good. And he'll say, yeah. thank you, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I love it. You know, a, right. Right. Yeah. And uh, it just made me think of that. Yeah. Enjoy those, enjoy those blessings God gives you. Right. Yeah, we, we haven't even talked about debt. I think we'll, we could probably do a standalone on what does the Bible say about debt at some point, but there's yeah. one more verse I want to get to. And I, cause I think we've really been talking about the accumulation of money, um, dabbling into the, the lack of money that in a lot of ways mirrors the idolatry that, that, um, money can become, whether you have an abundance or a lack of it. Um, but first Timothy six, verse 17 through 19 says, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. And that which is truly life is Christ. <laughs> I mean, so just to, right. to be explicit on that interpretation there, but th I think this is a, that's a great passage for for those who are, are blessed with abundance and um I, I don't know if we're we're hitting our audience on this but um <laughs> this is this is a a great great discussion i, I uh, appreciate where we've gone with this any other uh stones you want to turn on this one no but you know i, I just want to say thank you for all those blessed saints that you know it uh just being my home congregation over the years and, and now that i'm here also as well but i also hear stories from other congregations of of Christians who have been blessed with with means and they leave a lot you know their farms or they'll leave things to to the church and, and their wills and uh, just for the sake of keeping the ministry going right and, and it's just uh that's just one of those great untold stories yep no and that's that there's beauty in that when you when you see um those a lot of times unexpected um, and des definitely like we've been saying unnecessary gifts, but, right. but able to be used for the glory of God. What a, what a great way. And yeah, there's been many people who blessed me over, over the years. I, I got a pass. I won't name him, but there was a, a pastor who uh, during my seminary days, he, he just sent me a, a check for $200 every month. And it was one of those things where he didn't have to do it. I never even asked him for it. And we had like a tangential relationship, but he knew what it was to be a seminarian and he knew what, what those times were like. And he just told me he was going to do this. And, you know, I'd, I'd love to be able to do that for somebody someday down the road. It's just a, a great thing to, to be able to bless others with the things that, that we, the tools that we have in this world to, to move. And I really got to see that firsthand when I was at, at my two years at seminary, when you mentioned seminary, uh, the food co-op and the things, you know, cause we got a lot of young families that, uh, Came there. I was fortunate enough that I would live there through the week and go home on the weekends. And my wife still worked and she still works where she's at. But a lot of those young couples would come there. I mean, they really didn't start out with much and they're going there with nothing. I mean, right. they have very little and they have two or three kids, maybe. And they totally relied upon the generosity of those Christians in the Fort Wayne area. Right. And it was always, you'd hear of a farmer who would just go and have a steer butcher, you know, just so they can, you know stock up the the meat shelf there at, at the co-op just little things like that it was just amazing you hear this over and over again um things yeah. we should talk about more of actually because they're just great stories great examples yep great yeah yep. So. all right well i think we'll uh sign off there i'd love to hear your uh feedback your questions and um got some good questions after last week's uh end of the world uh talk so um Love to hear what you have to say about this. And uh, um, if you've got any uh, topics for consideration, we'd love to, to take this on and uh, and see what we can do. What do you think about uh, throw this open and, and and our audience can also judge in, or chime in on this? Is some of those questions we do get, can we spend maybe the first five or ten minutes answering some of those questions on each, each of our episodes? Yeah, no, I think that'd be great if we had some. Uh, some questions that we follow up with. That'd be a good good yeah. way to do that. Yep. So everybody start.
pumping in the questions. We're looking forward to them. So. Yeah, or maybe we could even just do a short follow-up video, you know, your Q questions and about what the Bible says about money. So, right. yeah, send them our way. We'll see what we can do to, to take them on and, and share the uh, share the knowledge. Of it. <laughs> I hope it's worthy knowledge as the Lord gives us. Let's go with the Lord's blessing. Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and love